All right. I am excited for this one. Rob Murgatroyd, welcome aboard. I am so freaking excited to be here. I mean, this has been a journey for you that I feel like from the wings I have been a part of. So I'm, I'm honored. I, I, we were talking about this before we, we jumped on here. You are probably, I hate to use the word passive, but like you are the most passive mentor I have probably had because you and I really haven't spent a lot of time connecting, talking, but so much of what you do has influenced what I do today just from watching you from what I call the cheap seats <laughs> and even down to podcasting. Here I am doing a podcast interview now and I, I remember uh, Chris, you know, a mutual friend of ours, Chris Harder, and I were talking about podcasting, and he said, you will go down as the greatest podcaster in the history of podcasting. So, so. I'll tell you what, the one thing I love about um, Chris is he makes you feel like you could fly. He yes. just has an ability to breathe life into you in a way that I've yes. never heard anybody do it. And sometimes you just need somebody to believe in you. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't be more well said. So let's, let's level set. Um, you know, you are a former chiropractor turned lifestyle entrepreneur, and we'll get into that story. Yep. But, you know, one thing, you're, you're, you're born in Queens, outside of, you know, in the borough of New York. And one thing that has always amazed me, Rob, is when you just, the number of podcast interviews I've listened to, and just people you, you know, in general, who are, have become extremely, extremely successful business professionals, entrepreneurs have come out of a borough of New York City. What's in the water there? Is it something that you bring can go back to your childhood that why so many successful people have come out of New York City? You know, it's an interesting thing. I, um, I interviewed um, a guy named Phil Rosenthal who created Everybody Loves Raymond's and mm -hmm. he's from Queens too. Um, you know, whether it's Donny Deutsch on CNBC or it's our president of the United States, you know, like it is... It is peculiar at how many people come out of there, and so much so that uh, my wife Kim feels the same way as you do. She's from New Hampshire, and she said, "You know, we should write a book called Straight Out of Queens, um, and you know, profile all of the people out of." So, like, what is it about Queens? Well, the best way I can put it is um, when you're in a city with nine million people, and you know, in in my case, I had um, in my little developments where I lived in, there were 18 buildings and there were 10 families on each floor and there were, you know, it, it just went up. You're, you're, you're scrapping for survival. You're trying desperately to be seen. Um, you will get bulldozed over if you aren't quick on your feet. Um, Queens has 120. It's, if you if you wiki Queens, you'll see that there are more nations living in the county of Queens or the borough of Queens than any place in the world. Wow! Which means that I it is not unusual for me to have somebody in the apartment on my left from Ethiopia and somebody from China on my right. So mm -hmm. I grew up listening to literally 120 different. Um, languages and acts, you know, accents and countries. Um, and that kind of diversity forces you to grow up very, very quickly. Um, there was a lot of crime there at the time. Um, there, you know, it's this mix of some of the, you know, best schools in the world, some of the highest crime. Um, and New York City is the center of the universe. I mean, you know, it's like anything that's anything comes out of New York City in many ways not to be an elitist, but it's just kind of the way it is, yeah. you know? Um, so you are, you're forced into survival. That's how I would answer that. I know it's a I long answer. I was going to say, I feel like people who've grown up in New York city, nothing was ever handed to you. You can't, you can't like you, yeah. you get, you get crushed. You just, you can't, you have to be, that's why most New Yorkers come across as so brash and so harsh and so rude it's, it's not that it's like when you're walking down the street and you are elbow to elbow with people and you're just trying to catch a freaking cab, you've got to knock down the guy in front of you or you're not getting, you will sit there all, I just watched the tourists. I'm like, that girl ain't ever getting a cab. I can tell you, it's not going to happen. I've never done that myself. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Yeah. yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Now we, uh, you know, you haven't, you didn't have the easiest of childhoods, right? I did not, and, no. and you didn't grow up with the best influences in the world. But shortly after high school, you got yourself out of New York City 
and you went down to Atlanta and where that's where really your first, let's call it the first half of your professional career started yep. when you, uh, you landed in chiropractic school. Yep. Um, how was it? I'm just curious. How was it for you as a kid growing up in, in New York city to now find yourself in the Southern part of the United States? You know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because because my childhood was, um, for those that don't know my story, it, you know, in, in 10 seconds or left, my, less, my dad was an alcoholic and I was, uh, I was beaten a lot as a kid. And uh, he was a truck driver and he basically would come home at like three or four in the afternoon and just go to the bar and get drunk. Um, and then we would, me and my two brothers would just hide when he came home trying not to, you know, catch uh, the wrong end of, of the stick. Um, so as you can imagine, many of, many of my memories of those years, um, are colored with, you know, with a lot of sadness, but as I've sort of like worked through those demons, there are, there are some things about those years, um, that were really just incredible. I mean, it, it's like in so many ways, it was like the Bronx tale. You know, it was um, it was such a strange thing. Like I can remember, you know, at you know one or two o'clock in the morning, getting a knock on the door from a guy named Second Story Joe, and it wasn't until you know I was like thirteen or fourteen years old, and I'd be like, "Why do they call him Second Story Joe?" It's because he breaks into people's houses, steals their TVs, and he comes and he sells them to the to the neighborhood. <laughs> and I was like, "We've been buying." hot TVs for like, yeah, we've never actually, we never bought a television set from the store ever. Wow. And it was, he was just like a junkie that would come in and, you know, I, like if I needed homework done or help with my homework, I'd have to go to the bar down the block and I'd have all the drunks help me with my algebra and nobody knew, you know, what the hell was going on. So in many ways, these stories on the one hand are incredibly depressing. And on the other hand, they're like, it, they're so unique. Like you don't get that from Kansas, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, so when you have that and you compare that to what it was like for me when I first landed in Atlanta, I remember when I, I had the choice between two chiropractic schools. One was uh, New York Chiropractic College. Uh, at the time it was in Long Island. Um, and uh, the other was in Atlanta, Georgia. And so my brother, who's a lawyer, who was in law school at the time, he said, yeah, why don't you get out of the city? Go to, go to Atlanta, check it out. And my vision was that Atlanta was like tumbleweeds. It was like the only thing I saw on TV was like, you know, deliverance. So I was like, I, this is going to, like, I, I'm not going to survive here. Mm -hmm. But I went in and um, my apartment was 300 bucks a month. It overlooked a swimming pool. There were girls in bikinis. It had maid service. Um, I went to breakfast. It was 99 cents. I was like, are you kidding me? This thing has existed all these years. Like I have great weather. I'm paying 300 bucks a month. I got my own apartments, beautiful women all over. Like it was, it was like I landed on Jupiter. I was like, I'm in. That is awesome. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> I think if anybody's listening right now, they're saying, wait a second, you got all of that for $300 a did. month? <laughs> did. Now, also, also, I graduated chiropractic school in 93, and I did 290. So we're talking about, you know, probably 80, 89. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. No. Well, and, and, you know, when I think about your childhood growing up in New York City and um, just reading your story a little bit. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you got the hustle mentality pretty early. And in many ways, it was maybe to avoid having to be at home or whatever it was, but you just wanted to find a reason to be out and be working and transition that to Atlanta. You're now a chiropractor. I've got to believe that New York hustle allowed you to quickly establish your practice and grow it pretty significantly, pretty quickly. Yeah, I think so. I think um, by nature, you know, everything, everything for me, as I've gotten older, I'm 53 now, and I, I look back on decisions that I've made, you know, with much more mature eyes. And I realized that those decisions were made in response to whatever my dad did, I wanted to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a truck driver, I want to be a doctor. He didn't make a lot of money, I want to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We grew up in an apartment, I wanted a house. He, he drove a shitbox car, I needed a, a, a Porsche. Yep. So like everything was in response to that. So I was largely driven 
by um, giving the, uh, not the illusion, I was large, the impression. I wanted, I wanted to give people the impression. I wanted everybody to know how successful I mm. was. It wasn't from a place of me truly wanting the house or the car or whatever. It was it was like look what I did. Look yep. how I created this. So so to answer the question baked into that is a natural entrepreneurial drive. I can't sit still. I need to keep moving. Yep. Um and I think some of that is DNA. I think some of that is growing up in Queens, and I think some of that is in response to um, wanting to do the opposite of what my dad did. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, and you know, you, you look at your success you had as a chiropractor, right? You, yeah. You had the stuff. Mm -hmm. You had the house. You had yeah. the money, but it also burned you out. And yeah. there's a there's an, a moment I want you to go to, and it was kind of your aha moment, mm -hmm. and that's when you read a book. Yep. called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And if oh. you've never read that book, do yourself a favor, go pick it up today or listen to it in Audible. But what was it about the book or what was it about Tim said, Rob, that kind of lit that light bulb in your head? Well, you know, like everything in life, right? It showed up just at the right time in my life. Um, I was starting to become a little disenchanted with chiropractic. I think Let's see, I think Tim just celebrated his 10th year on the book. So, you know, I've been practicing 25 years. So I was probably 15 years-ish into my career. I was starting to become, you know, it was just, it was just like, you know, doing the same shit like every day of neck pain and back pain and car accidents and, you know, stuff like that just became boring after a while. And, but I didn't, I didn't see any other path and I wasn't, you know, the internet wasn't in existence at the time. Um, for most of my chiropractic career. So the idea of being able to have, you know, an internet based business um, run, you know, in any automated way was so foreign to me that I didn't embrace it. And, you know, here this, you know, this kid from New York, Tim Ferriss, you know, writes this book, um, you know, albeit he's an Ivy League kid from Princeton. Um, but he's, you know, his parents were like, his mom was a teacher, his dad was a physical therapist. So he didn't come from these, you know, crazy successful people, but he was just, you know, he's uniquely smart and he's driven and he worked hard. And so I felt like there was a lot of things that, that I resonated with. Um, and you know, there wasn't one thing in the book. It was more like the idea and the possibility that I could like, when I think about the idea of scaling something mm -hmm. and selling a million things in the same way that I can sell one thing was fascinating to me because if I can come up with something that would allow me to sell a zillion of them while I'm sleeping at night, um, it really, it really connected to sort of that part of my, like I'm a, I'm a systems guy. I like systems. I like procedures. I like organized things. And if I could find out how to, how to unlock the code of being able to sell something like that, then, um, then I was all in because I wanted to be able to spend my time traveling and doing other things. So, um, you know, that's kind of how that came up. Well, and that, that's, again, that, that resonates with me because most of my career has been in the health insurance industry and there's one way to make money and that's to get hired by one prospect at a time. And for me, it was, that's all I knew until surrounding myself with entrepreneurs, surrounding myself with other people who I'm like, well, wait a second. These people have seven, eight different multiple, seven, eight different revenue streams. These people are making money while they sleep. What is this new concept that, that, I, haven't, that I haven't known about? And like you said, the, once that light bulb turns on, you can't turn it off. You can't turn it off. Um, and then, you know, there was a lot of trial and error. I had to figure out how to do that. You know, it, it's one thing to read the book and, you know, get all excited about the theory. It's another thing, you know, like the first thing I started, you're going to laugh at me, but the first thing I started was, um, uh, it was a, a website on how to cure hemorrhoids. And <laughs> we were literally like drop, drop, drop ship in like hemorrhoid cream. Kim and I still laugh at it all the time. Like we were like hemorrhoids the, everybody's got them. <laughs> it's a well, it, it, I mean like we convince ourselves it has a pain point it's a solution <laughs> there's a big market they search these words 
And so we literally built the hemorrhoids. I was just going to say, you know, the first thing you always got to establish is what is, what is the villain here? It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's a pain in the ass. You got it. It's, it was a, I had a strong villain, a strong pain point. I had everything. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, early on, let's go back to, to 2006. This yeah. is where you started to get the work hard, play hard itch, right? And it led you and Kim uh, to, to start Jet Set. And if you wouldn't mind taking a minute or two telling the audience what Jet Set, it, what, it, what it was. And I know that your perception of what work hard, play hard meant was a little bit different back then. Yeah. And so if you wouldn't mind going into a little bit, uh, a little bit of that for a while, that'd be great. So yeah, around 2006, um, Kim and I decided that we wanted to explore and do different things, but we just, weren't, we just weren't exactly sure what we wanted to do, but we knew that we loved travel. So we started developing these little um, niche you know, websites and we were getting like mediocre success and it was kind of like we were doing okay, but certainly not enough for me to leave my job. Um, and so we started watching what people were asking us about. People were like, hey, you guys are in you know, Saint-Tropez. Um, you know, I, I love, I, 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 I would love to be able to do something like this. Um, you know, there was, there were two camps. Camp number one was if I went to Saint-Tropez, um, as an example, where would I go? What would I do? And how would I do it? And I was like, okay, well, that could be a market for guidebooks. You know, there were no apps at the time we could start selling guidebooks. Mm -hmm. And so we started putting guidebooks together and then people started to say, Hey, I love, you know, watching what you guys are doing. Um, it's, it's giving me this little escape feeling so I can, you know, be home on my computer, like our mutual friend, Chris, Chris Harder and Lori, you know, before, while Lori was still a, a trainer at LA fitness, she was like, Chris and I would watch your travel videos while we were walking around our home, you know, in, uh, in, uh, Minnesota, one of those places, one yeah. of those M places in the Midwest. Um, and so it, there became this aspirational market yeah. and I was like, oh, okay, well, let's shoot travel videos. So um, and then people started to say, well, what I really want to know is how are you guys affording to do these trips? So then I started a product called Jet Set Money. So I was like, I was like, fill, and I would interview guys like Pat Flynn and stuff like that and ask them, you know, how, how are you automating things? And it was one of these things where I like, I knew that what we were doing, I was on the right road because one night we were at a club. Um, we went to this, uh, club in uh, in greece and it's 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 a really really late club like it's crazy it starts at 3 a.m like you really have to go to bed and then wake up to go to the club mm -hmm. because it's around sunrise it's okay. all about starting at three in the morning so around um seven o'clock in the morning the sun comes up and uh, this girl walks over to us and she says uh, are you guys the jet set life people and I was like, it was the first time ever that anybody ever recognized us. And I was like, yes, we are. Um, and she said, uh, oh, my God, I follow you guys all the time and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, let's go out for breakfast. So we went out for breakfast and she said, you know, my boyfriend would love you guys. And I said, really? She said, yeah, he just wrote a book. And I said, what's the book? She said, it's an entrepreneurial book. In fact, he's going to be, uh, where do you live? And I said, I'm in Atlanta. She goes, oh, too bad, because he's going to do Good Morning America in New York. And I said, what's his name? She said, his name's Tim Ferriss. <laughs> and I said, I said, the four-hour work week? And she said, you know it? I said, yeah. And so it was like one of those things where I was like, all these things started coming together mm -hmm. that made no sense. And so we had to kind of figure out what to do. But at that time, I was still coming out of, you know, the, that douchey period of like, I just built a, a 10,000 square foot house and I had a Porsche and a BMW and a Mercedes. And every nickel I had, I was, I was grinding away at work so I could buy the next fancy car, grinding away at work so I can get a bigger house, grinding away. So, and it just... It was like I was spending what I was making. I was leveraged more than I should have. I was putting more things on credit card than I should have. And I was like, this is, like, this is not fulfilling me. I am, I am a slave to work to pay for all this shit. Like, why, like what is going, like I need to find a way to do this. And where it got confusing was I love travel. I love going to Saint-Tropez. I love going to Mykonos. I love the South. I, I love all of these things. I didn't want to give it up, but I didn't want to spend my life working either. So I had yep. to kind of like evolve and go, 
well, how do you work hard and play hard? How do you do both? Yep. And then that's how work hard, play hard. Got well, and it's interesting because the, the one side is your chiropractic business allowed you to pay for all of that mm-hmm. and have that lifestyle. But there also came a point, and honestly, it seems like not all that long ago where you hit that point. You're like, I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. Was there a moment, an event, a time, a specific time that you can recall just a few years ago when you were just so done with being the chiropractor that you came home and was like, I, I'm done. I can't do this. Yeah, it was one of the, you're married, so you'll understand this. It was one of those moments where um, my wife had been listening to me for the last five years complain about my dissatisfaction with my career. And she looked at me and she said, just, I'll never forget it. She said, it's over. You're done. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, December 31st, which was last year, December 31st, it's over. You're not going to ever adjust another patient again, ever. Hmm. And I went, well, how the hell are we going to do it? She goes, I don't care. She says, I don't care if we live in a box. I don't care what we do. Your life is not worth continuing on doing something that you hate yep. or no longer inspires you. No knock to chiropractors. It's a noble profession, but doing anything for 25 years, you just get bored of potentially. Yep. Um, and we made a decision together on that day, that December 31st, if I couldn't sell the office, um, we were going to walk away from it. And that led us into a whole different trajectory, which I'll tell you quickly, which was us saying, okay, we can't sell the office. We tried. We weren't able to do it because um, most of the guys who would buy the office would be new docs. Mm-hmm. When you have a practice that's a million dollar practice, they don't have a million dollars. And all they have is a bunch of debt because yep. they just got out of $200,000 in chiropractic school. Um, and their credit is usually crappy. And the successful docs are like, I've been practicing 20 years. The one who could afford it, they're like, I don't need to buy yours. I have my own. So it was not easy to mm-hmm. sell it. So we made a decision to walk away from it. Um, but at the very last minute, uh, uh, one of the chiropractors across the street from my office um, made us an offer to take over our patients. So um, <clears throat> that's how that deal got brokered. So we sat down and we said, okay, well, now, now we have act two. Now we're going to reinvent yeah. our life. And I want to go into that. I got a couple yeah. questions there. Yeah, go ahead. Before, yeah. before you dive into that, if that's yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. You said something earlier that I want, I, don't, I want to make sure people don't miss. Yeah. When you and Kim started Jet Set back in 06 and you started living into what it, the life you wanted to have yeah. is when everything started to line up, didn't it? Yeah. One of my favorite all-time books is The Alchemist. Yeah. And just the, the reason I love that book is it's all about trusting the omens, right? When you are living the life you know you should be living, the universe just starts lining things up for you. And so that, that little story, as small as it seemed, is, is so important. I want to read something to you. Yep. Um, if you don't mind. Kim wrote a beautiful post about you on Instagram. Oh. And I think this is going to lead to a question I want to ask because here we are, you're 53 years old now, much different, much wiser version of Rob than maybe 30 years ago, right? Yep. And Kim wrote, at 28, he became a chiropractor. At 32, he became a daddy. At 40, he became a podcaster and travel video host and started an online business. At 44, he became a published fitness model. At 47, he fell in love with electronic music, so he became a club DJ, which we didn't get into. At 48, he became a dad. At 49, he became a six-figure network marketer, and at 51, he brought he he went back to podcasting. Looking yeah. at yourself right now at age fifty three, Rob, what would you tell the twenty seven ver- year old version of yourself? Do what feels good, and trust your internal guidance system. There is a small, still voice that's inside you that um, whispers. Does not even talk loudly. It whispers, and you have to really calm your mind. Meditation is a good way to do it. Calm your mind and listen and look for what feels good. Not what makes sense on paper, not what the next logical step is, not the goal that's going to get you the X amount of dollars, which is going to make you happy, but the voice that is inside of you that says, you like this, 
you want to mm. do this. It feels good when you do mm. this and you're excited by this. That is the GPS that's inside of you that guides you and will take you. It'll never steer you wrong. There's never going to be a time where it's going to steer you wrong. Don't confuse the voice with, you know, if you have something that you're not doing, don't confuse it with being a cop out for not doing the work. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you're doing the work that is not, you know, a 10 out of 10 for you, not, not that it's hard or not that you got to get through a hump, but if you're like, you know, like sometimes I'll, I'm doing stuff and I'm like back to back all day long. I'm like, oh, this was a day. But at the end of it, I'm like, I love it, you mm -hmm. know? So like it's listening to that voice. That, that's yeah. the advice I would that's give. Awesome. I, all I wanted to do was just, you know, go, okay, you, you bought and sold 10 offices. I, I'm going to do that too. Cause you, you made a bunch of money doing that. Okay. Yep. You're doing this. I want to do that too. I was just yep. looking for money. Yep. That's a, that's a great, great answer there. So many people right now, I think are just chasing the money. So they're willing to try any short-term hack, silver bullet, whatever it would take to get that and not truly living out the life they know they want to be having, which I want you to go into this. And I think you are about to go there because I think this is such a magical journey. Mm -hmm. So last year, you were fortunate enough to sell the office, mm -hmm. but you guys didn't just stay put in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You guys had quite the 2019, which resulted in you being where you are today in, on the West coast of, of the United States, living yep. the life you want to be living. And you've Straight always up. dreamed of living for the listeners. Take us through what 2019 was like for the Murgatroyd family. So it was such an, a magical journey to watch. Well, you know, like I said, December 31st, we made the decision that um, it was over and I was never going to do it again, which meant that we, we play a little game we call stupid idea time. And we took out a white sheet of paper and we said, okay, well, if chiropractic wasn't here anymore and all the bitching and complaining about you hating your life, about what you were doing was gone and you can do anything that you want to do, what would it be? Mm -hmm. And I said, it's pretty simple. I would be um, living in Southern California where I can walk to the beach, learn how to surf um, and um, live that outdoor fitness related Southern California lifestyle. Like, you know, if you've ever seen like a sun kiss commercial from 1987, <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it was the Pamela. If you're, if you're old enough to remember. If you're old enough to remember that. I mean, it's like, I think I still have a Pamela Anderson poster on my wall. Um, but that's what I wanted. And I said to her, what do you want? And she said, I've always wanted to live in Florence. I've, there are countries that I haven't been to. And I would like to go on an extended trip for four months just with um, uh, one piece of luggage each and just travel from country to country over four months. And I said, fuck it. Let's do it. December 31st, let's, let's get out of here and let's travel. And, um, you know, it started in Mykonos, Greece for uh, the Work Hard, Play Hard event uh, that we'll get into later, I'm sure. Yeah. And um, I had another work hard, play hard event uh, four months later uh, that was in Italy. And so we went from the first event to the last event or to the next event. And those four months we spent um, traveling from country to country with the bulk of that, uh, with two months uh, being living in, uh, in Florence, Italy. And then um, I'll never forget it. We were sitting on a rooftop in Florence looking out at the Duomo and we had you know, two weeks left uh, on our trip. And I said, well, all the stuff that we just put in the pod in Atlanta, we got to find a pod company to pick it up and drive it to California. Um, and we had to find a place. We found a place from Florence to live in California. We were right. FaceTiming um, the property and mm -hmm. we literally got the property via FaceTime. We had the truck deliver our cars, the truck deliver our furniture, and then we had one of our friends here in California uh, meet the pod, and um, we flew from Florence directly to California and just started our life wow. here. So it like literally just unfolded, and everything on the vision board, it's crazy. You hear these stories, but this one was so true. Like we took, we cut out pictures of the yoga studio, the exact studio, the coffee place, like the exact coffee yeah, yeah. place we we're going to go to, and our life is literally 
Like if you look at that vision board and you look at where I'm going, like today when, I, when I'm done with you, I'm going over to the beach. Like it is yeah. literally, literally the, the same life. That is, you talk about manifestation and the power of visualization. Yeah, there's, there's not a better story out there. That, that's absolutely amazing, Rob. So yeah. you said something I want to hit upon now and go a little deeper in. Our work hard, our work hard play hard experiences. You have got such, you're the creator of such a cool concept. At one time, you know, it was referred to as the work hard play hard mastermind. Now, probably more appropriately, the work hard play hard experience. Yeah. Tell us about that. What is that and who is it for? Well, you know, for, for those people that are making a picture in their mind of what a mastermind is, a mastermind by definition is, you know, taking a, a collective of people, 5, 10, 20 people, whatever, um, putting them together and having them sort of like help each other to grow their businesses. Yep. And most of those masterminds are done in places like hotels. And so you're in, you know, like um, you're in the table with the long, you're in the hotel with the long table and the white tablecloth and the mint and the water and the prepackaged speaker. And, you know, you break off into little groups and you do your thing and it works great for some people. But for me, most of the, um, the hockey stick growth that I've had in my life has been around some random conversation that I've had with somebody um, in a location that was outside of my familiar surroundings um, and al allowed me to get away from my problems and rise above it and mm -hmm. sort of look down. And, you know, if I'm, <clears throat> if I'm in, you know, the South of France having a glass of champagne with uh, our mutual friends, Chris and Lori Harder, and we're talking business, there is a very different level of conversation that happens when you're in that state of mind in that location doing unique things than it would be in the back of a Marriott in Hoboken, New Jersey. So I just made the decision that I wanted to curate or craft an experience that simulated those kinds of environments. And to give you um, a couple of quick reference points, um, for example, we went to, uh, turning around here because one of the pictures is behind me. We went to, um, if you could see it, uh, that picture right. TB12. It went to TB12. Um, I hired uh, Tom Brady's uh, trainer to, uh, to shut down TB12 and train us on how he does, um, how he does pliability training. Um, we uh, went to a museum there. We hired a museum curator to teach us how to look at art. Like, you know, we walk in a room and we had these little prompts and, mm -hmm. you know, she would say like, who would you most want to have lunch with? Who would you least want to have lunch with? And she taught us how to look at art differently. Um, and, uh, you know, we went uh, to, uh, to the South of France and in the morning they woke up and there were vintage cars, um, 1960s and 70s Rolls Royces and Ferraris that were waiting for them. And we did a, a vintage car ride through the French Riviera and um, had a, a, a goal setting session at the top of a castle in Ez in France. Um, the next day we had uh, speedboats set up for them to take them to Saint Tropez for the day. Um, in, uh, in Italy, we took them, uh, truffle hunting with a dog, uh, going through, uh, mm. the hills of Chianti. Um, so it's all of these experiences and I'm working, um, I'm working now on the next one, which is going to be in Marrakesh. And, you know, I don't want to, I, I can't tell you what it is yet because we're, they're all surprises, yes. but, um, it is, uh, it's going to be the best one we've ever done. And, uh, it is, it's just a way for high end entrepreneurs. And by high end, I mean, they're usually making between half a million and, mm -hmm. and up, um, a year, um, to connect, meet each other, yep. collaborate. We have a lot of them now that are, that are working uh, together on different projects. Yep. Um, and, um, and there's all kinds of uh, uh, masterminding sessions yep. that are done during the events. Well, and, and you, what you, you bring up such a good point. You didn't create this event to just talk shop, talk business. Your whole purpose of this event was to create an experience to bring others together, to connect and collaborate. And as a result, guess what happens? People start doing business together. People start creating together. So what you have created, again, Amy and I have watched this kind of from the outside. It is, it is absolutely magical to see. Um, can't, can't wait till you announce who your next, what your next locations are going to look like. So, yep. um, hold on. Had a semi just go by really. 
I'll edit that out. <laughs> okay. All right. Last few questions. Cause I know you want to get back. You want to get out to the beach here. Yeah. What does work hard, play hard mean to you today? Um, doing what you want, when you want with whoever you want, as often as you want. That's awesome. You know, it's not, it's, it, it's the, the place in my life that I'm in right now is it's, if it does not excite me, if I don't feel good, like in my gut, in my chest, if I am doing something that does not feel good, I don't do it anymore. Yeah. I just don't do it. So for me, work hard, play hard is whatever the work I'm doing like this right now, I'm enjoying this conversation with you. I'm liking, yeah. um, I'm, I'm liking sharing this with the world. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm all in on it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, tomorrow morning I have my surf lesson, you know, with my 70 year old lifeguard <laughs> surf instructor. <laughs> and I am so excited yeah. to do that. Like I'm going to, I'm going to spend tonight, Friday night waxing my surfboard. You know what I mean? It doesn't even need to be waxed. <laughs> yeah. Um, just because I love it, you yeah. know? So it's like yeah. everything, it's just really, for me, it's, it's doing the work that you absolutely love to do and doing the play that you love to do. And here's where it gets confusing for people. People are like, yeah, but I, I can't afford to go to Europe or I can't afford to, you know, live like, I, that's not what it is. I don't care if it's going to Trader Joe's and finding, if you love wine and yep. getting a $6 bottle of wine, that's a 4.1 on Vivino and you're opening a book about Italy, which we do often and reading, uh, you know, a passage from one of the Francis Mays books on, you know, under the Tuscan sun type stuff, but that's something you love and you're passionate about, then just do that. Like that, yeah. if that's your play, then let that be your yeah, play. Define your own play. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with this question, Rob. What advice would you give that business professional that has the money, has the house, has the cars, but that flame inside isn't very bright anymore and they know that there's something missing inside? What advice would you give them right now? Number one, to listen to it. And number two, make a decision to act on not uh, being in that anymore if you don't want to be in, in, in it anymore. It is very, very easy to play at a, a B minus and just have it be 72 degrees in your life. It's not too bad. It's not too good. It's not too hot. It's not yeah. too cold. It pays the bills, but I don't make millions. I make millions, but I'm not, you know, it's very easy to be in that lukewarm place. My advice would be that if you've decided that it is no longer serving you and look, you know, if it's no longer serving you, like if you, you know, if, 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 if you got the $10 million check, and you could do anything you'd want to do, you know, after you slept with the whole Swedish volleyball, team, <laughs> you know, like, what are you, what are you going to do with your life? Yeah. You know, like, what do you want to do? And then set a date. The thing that made the difference for me was setting a date. If I didn't have December 31st, like it wasn't, there's a difference between deciding yep. and resolving. Yeah. Like I was resolved that December 31st, there was no more, which meant I had to notify my staff. I yep. had to, uh, I had to, you know, everything had to happen. So it yep. was the commitment of the date. Well, and, and, you know, with, to wrap it up, this is why I wanted to have you on this interview. You and I are chatting on May 22nd. Yep. It wasn't, uh, but two months ago that the world went on pause. Right. Mm -hmm. And up until that point, I think the society as a whole, it has been taught to chase the money, chase the houses, chase the cars. Even if you burn yourself out, who cares? Get the stuff. And I think this period in time has made everybody pause and reflect what really matters in life. And something you said, that moment you made that decision literally was when you said, fuck it. Done. We're going to do it. Not even 18 months ago, you were a chiropractor in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You and your family are now living the life you've dreamed of on the West Coast in California. Guys, it's about deciding and taking action. And I say it every single time, when clarity and confidence collide, action happens. It so, does. and then power, power moves to you, which is yes. important. I think the universe will, like there's a, uh, there's a bandwidth that, there's a, uh, not bandwidth, there's, there's um, when you make a decision to do something, when you're, when you're working in some, a career that you don't love, Nothing can come in that space 
because that, that space is being occupied. Yep. But when you say I'm done with it and you open it up and you, you let the universe know that I'm not doing this anymore, I want to do something else, then all of a sudden things start to show up in your life. And in the way that you mentioned earlier with Paul Coelho's Alchemist book, the universe starts to conspire and yep. bend its will in your favor because you did your part and you made the decision yep. to listen to your gut. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rob, thank you. Thank you. It was an honor. It was a lot of fun. I think, hey. uh, I think you have a, a career ahead of you in the world of podcasting. You <laughs> we'll and, uh, Again, you and- I, I, I'm sitting here right now just trying to grab your coattails. So, um, <laughs> well, and, listen- and guys, if you, by the way, if you're listening to this, do yourself a favor and go check out Rob's Work Hard, Play Hard uh, podcast. It is the most underrated podcast out there today. Uh, Rob is an unbelievable interviewer. You, you not, you're not going to want to miss it. Go, go check it out. And, and please do me a favor. If you're finding the bullpen sessions to be extremely insightful and helpful, I would love it for you to go subscribe, give it a five-star rating, and please share it with anybody that you also would find it beneficial. So until next time, Rob, thank you one last time. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, guys, go make it happen.